Welcome on behalf of the World Affairs City Series, which is provided with funding by GSB. I'm Karin Brandt, co-chair of the Planning Committee, and before I introduce tonight's panel, I would like to encourage you to attend upcoming lectures. Thomas Melville will be speaking on Witness to Terror in Central America and Ron Hennessy, immediately following this lecture next door in the South Ballroom. Tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the Campanile Room, Torture and the War on Terror by Jumana Musa of Amnesty International. And an expert on walking, Mark Fenton, on walkable communities, will be here Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the Oak Room. The Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics has invited ABC's Lynn Shear Tuesday, November 28th at 7.30 in the Sun Room. And now tonight's panel of Iowa State faculty will discuss how to spend $50 billion to make the world a better place. Professor Peter Erasm of Economics will summarize his recent presentation at a UN conference on prioritizing limited resources to end poverty. Professors Tony Smith from Philosophy, Robert Mazur from Sociology, and Francis Owusu from Community and Regional Planning will respond. And now here is Professor Mary Sawyer, Director of the Religious Studies Program, who will moderate the discussion. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Good evening. I get to do the fun job, keeping people in line, including my department chair. We will start with a presentation of about 20 minutes by Professor Arazim, and then we will have the three respondents in order of about 10 minutes each, and then they will have an opportunity, if they choose to do so, to respond to one another, and then we'll open this up for questions and answers. So, let us begin. <coughs> well, I think we ought to start off with uh, some truth in packaging. Uh, the title actually is, is by Bjorn Lundberg, who edited the book uh, of this title and, and began the Copenhagen Consensus. And uh, uh, I think it's real expensive to bring uh, Bjorn Lundberg here, and so uh, I think there's some advantages that I have over over Professor Lundberg, uh, not the least of which I'm here at Iowa State and uh, do this for free. So, and I think any of the other advantages really don't matter. So that's that's why I was asked to uh, participate in this particular panel. Uh, uh, Lundberg did send me, however, his, his PowerPoints, and so I think you can sort of say that you, you, you won't be able to meet Professor Lundberg, but you will see his slides, so we can, we can uh, uh, be Professor Lundberg once m removed. I will try to explain what his, his, his process was in setting this up. This uh, process began in about 2004 and has resulted in, in uh, two edited volumes on this topic of how to prioritize various strategies for economic development. And, uh, uh, and I'll, in, the, in the process, I think I'll tell you a little bit about what, what these conclusions were. If we can, well, ah, oh, good. We'll see if I can get my uh, computer to advance. So the idea is that uh, you can't do everything in, in trying to address all the problems of the world. And so um, if you uh, bring in a bunch of experts and get their opinions as to what various options are available, what kinds of, of, of results might, uh, might uh, um, a group of, of experts come up with, and, and then in fact is, is what they come up with going to turn out to be meaningful to people who are actually in a position to, uh, to act on those, on those uh, suggestions. And so there are lots of problems, uh, and, and some of those are, are listed in the, uh, uh, in the slide. About 12% of the world is, is starving. Uh, about 50% of the world lives on, on less than $2 a day. Uh, you have roughly a third of the world that lacks sanitation, and we know the problems uh, associated with AIDS, uh, illiteracy, 
uh, and so on. And so when you have this mass of, of all these, these problems, what sorts of ways can you start to address strategies in order to solve those problems? And what Lomborg started off with was a budget constraint. The budget constraint is absolutely arbitrary. I'm, I'm not sure where he came up with $50 billion. It's roughly 20% of the annual expenditures uh, from international communities on economic development, to put that in perspective. And so the issue, I think, with setting up a budget constraint is just to sort of address what you would do first if you had some sort of uh, significant amount of money but still limited amount of money that you could use to address the world's problems. And these were the problems that, uh, that uh, they, they, they decided to, uh, to address. So you have, see climate change, uh, disease, uh, various types of problems in terms of malnutrition or, or uh, uh, poor governance or financial instability. All of these were considered major problems in the world community. There were other problems that they looked at, but these were the ten that they decided to address. And the idea is to uh, try to come up with a way of making a rational choice among these various options, taking the position that you can't do everything. And so the way they started this was to have ten prominent economists write uh, position papers on each of those uh, challenges. Then they had two other economists who uh, reacted to each of those uh, initial position papers. And then they had a final panel of eight experts who uh, came up with uh, rankings of the various options. And I'll, I'll close with what those rankings actually are uh, at the end of my discussion. Um, They've repeated this in a number of venues. Uh, the one that I participated in was uh, uh, doing a similar exercise in front of uh, a set of UN ambassadors and seeing what sorts of priorities or strategies they would come up with. But they've also done this in front of a group of, of uh, youth in, in Europe. They did it in front of a, a panel of experts in Uganda. And actually, they've ended up with relatively similar results across all those different varied uh, audiences. So just to give you a flavor for how this works, this is, is, is what happens in, in, in the case of, of climate change. So you sort of see what the problems are in terms of anticipated increases in temperature um, by 2100. And, uh, and so the economist who is working on this particular problem laid out what the problems are as, as they currently um, uh, are known, and then laid out various options for uh, addressing those problems, including uh, passing the Kyoto Protocols or uh, various other types of, of uh, pollution abatement mechanisms, such as carbon taxes <coughs> or uh, 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 the rights to pollute these, uh, these uh, tradable permits. And the problem with, with climate change is that all of the costs are very large, and they are in the current period, and all of the benefits end up occurring far in, into the future. And so if you discount those uh, benefits uh, relative to the costs, you end up with, uh, with results that are uh, of this sort. And so this is what the, the Copenhagen consensus tried to do, was to generate notions of costs and benefits and then to generate uh, benefit-cost ratios. And depending on how heavily you discount the future, uh, you end up with benefit-cost ratios that are less than one, meaning that the costs outweigh the benefits in terms of global climate change. Um, that doesn't mean that other options might be more favorable, uh, but uh, uh, the ones that uh, were considered in that first round of the 2004 Copenhagen consensus proved not to be uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly highly regarded by the panel. My particular uh, effort is for the 2008 round of the Copenhagen consensus, so they're going through another process, and they asked me to work on uh, the problems of illiteracy in the world. And just to put that in, in perspective, about a third of the uh, uh, populations, adult populations in low-income countries are illiterate, about 15% of the adult populations in middle-income countries uh, are illiterate. The World Bank estimates that the cost of attaining universal primary education varies between 11 
and $28 billion. So if you have a $50 billion budget constraint, you're halfway there uh, just by uh, trying to attain universal primary education. The problem is that the World Bank's estimates are based on notions of average costs, but the illiterate populations are likely to be more costly to serve than average. And so, in fact, you're going to end up with costs that are likely to be much higher than this, some estimates as high as five times higher uh, to attain uh, universal primary education. And so, uh, even within the context of just trying to attack illiteracy, you can, you can break the bank. And so, if you're going to try to figure out how to address illiteracy, one thing you might want to do is to look at which populations you need to serve that are, aren't currently being served by the educational systems that we have in place. And so those include adult uh, illiterates. Uh, girls, uh, on average, get less education than boys. Uh, rural children have less education than urban children. The poor have less education than the wealthy. And then you have various aspects of the problem uh, whether it be children who drop out before attaining literacy or children who never ended up going to school in the first place. And so if you look at, at those problems, you, you may want to start looking at which of those populations you can address relatively uh, more cost effectively. One of the aspects of education is that if you pay to have a child go to school and the child fails to gain literacy, to some extent, all those resources end up being wasted because it turns out if you fail to attain literacy, uh, much of the benefits of education don't exist. So you have to get up to a certain level of education in order to get any return whatsoever. Since most of the problems of illiteracy are related to children who fail to reach uh, grade school as opposed to children who never started grade school, it may be more cost effective to try to attack the problems of dropouts than to attack the problems of children who never ended up going to school. So how certain are we that going to school is going to solve the problem of literacy in worlds where school quality is extremely uh, tenuous in places? And the answer is that at least on average, uh, the longer you go to school, the more likely you are to attain literacy. And in most countries, by the time you reach the end of the primary cycle, uh, you reach permanent literacy. So you have some children who can attain literacy in the first few years of schooling in some countries, but the variance in the attainment of literacy gets smaller and smaller as you attain more and more years of schooling. And ultimately, by the time you get to five or six years of schooling in virtually all countries, you end up with uh, people attaining uh, literacy. So how certain are we of the returns to uh, going to school? And the answer is uh, we're pretty pretty confident that, that returns to schooling are, are extremely robust across lots of different populations, including uh, different types of countries, different types of economic systems, whether it's men or women or urban or rural children who are attaining uh, the, uh, uh, the returns. And so this is simply mapping out returns to schooling for a bunch of different uh, countries. And here, this is returns to women on the vertical axis, returns to schooling for, for men on the uh, horizontal axis. And if you end up in the northeast quadrant, it means you have positive returns to both men and women in that particular country, where uh, returns here are per year of schooling. So it's the percentage increase in income from an additional year of schooling. In virtually all the countries, the returns are positive for both men and women. Most of the points are above the 45 degree line, which suggests higher returns for women than men, uh, but the difference is relatively modest, about on average uh, around a 10 percent return on average for women, about a uh, 7 and change percent return uh, for men. So in real terms, these are significantly uh, large returns to schooling. If we do the same exercise for urban and rural populations, once again, if you're in the upper northeast quadrant, you're going to have positive returns for both urban and rural populations. In this case, returns to urban uh, uh, residents are in the vertical axis, returns to uh, urban residents in the horizontal axis. Uh, so all of these uh, lines suggest positive returns for both urban and rural uh, individuals. Most of the points lie below the 45-degree line, so higher returns on average for urban than rural populations, although there are exceptions.
but once again the returns are relatively strong, around 8% and change for urban populations, 7.5% returns per year of schooling for uh, rural populations, so the gaps are relatively modest. So we're very confident that increasing years of schooling uh, uh, can, can raise uh, returns. If you do the same exercise and simply cut these returns to schooling by the type of economic system in the country, what you find is that the gaps are, are even larger in terms of estimated returns. If you look at countries that are relatively uh, free economically, meaning that human capital can seek out its highest reward, not surprisingly you get higher returns to schooling in those countries than in countries where uh, you have more regulated economies. And so there are differences in terms of returns to schooling depending on how many regulations or restrictions you place on individuals, but nevertheless uh, the returns are still positive in, in both types of economic systems, although the gaps surprisingly perhaps are larger between more or less free economic systems than they are between men and women or between uh, urban and rural uh, residents. So we're pretty confident that we get returns to schooling and so the issue then is what's the most cost-effective way of adding years of schooling and uh, what the Copenhagen consensus wants people to do is to come up with alternative strategies and see what the economic uh, or other research suggests in terms of how uh, efficacious those various strategies have been. So the most obvious ones that people think about are building more schools or making those schools better and it turns out that the research isn't particularly promising in terms of how easily building more schools adds to years of schooling. And the problem, of course, is that all the costs are up front when you build more schools, and it requires that people actually respond to building those schools by uh, sending their children to school, which turns out not to be uh, necessarily the case. In almost all countries, at least at the primary level, children who are not in school are within reasonable distance of, uh, of a school. And so there are other things that are keeping them from taking advantage of the existing supplies. Got it. School quality, most of us are convinced that school quality matters. Uh, most of us in education certainly are convinced that school quality matters and most of us think that we're part of the high quality education that our children and, and uh, students deserve. Uh, the problem is that we have very little strong evidence of what it is that, that generates school quality across lots of different schools. Just as an example, there's a study that shows that some teachers systematically have students perform better uh, than others within school systems. The same children end up doing better in some classrooms than others. That happens year after year after year, but then when you look at the attributes of the teachers who systematically do well and against the attributes of the teachers that systematically do poorly, they look identical. So anything that you might use as a policy tool that would distinguish between a good teacher and a bad teacher turns out not, not to work well. A third item uh, that was discussed is, is the issue of school management and the notion that if you devolve power to the local entity, the local entity may be better able to make use of resources than, say, the central government allocating resources from, from the center. And there's lots of reasons why we're sympathetic to that in, in, in a democracy like the United States with a long history of, of local control of schools, and yet there's not a lot of evidence that in fact trying to devolve power uh, from the center to local authorities actually works systematically in developing countries. It turns out that the schools that act more autonomously do better, but those also tend to be the schools in the wealthier areas with more educated uh, parents and with more experienced teachers and school principals. And so when they actually look at the performance of sort of mandated decentralized control, it doesn't seem to work that well. So what happens in terms of things that actually seem to work are things that you have existing capacity that isn't fully utilized. And if you have ways of getting parents to send their children to school for a few more uh, years, 
or to take advantage of existing capacity that isn't fully utilized in, in existing schools, uh, then those might be the most cost-effective ways of, of trying to enhance schooling outcomes in developing countries. And there have been some uh, dramatic uh, successes in these sorts of demand-side uh, interventions. So one of these is to uh, uh, apply uh, various nutritional or health um, interventions at the level of the school. So for example, in Kenya, uh, where there was a 92% infestation rate of worms among uh, children, what they found out was simply applying uh, deworming medicine at the school at a cost of uh, roughly, literally, a couple dollars per child increased school attendance by about 40%. So the reason children weren't taking advantage of the existing capacity was they were sick. If you can somehow attack the problem that's preventing children from getting into the schools, then perhaps you can have some of these dramatic outcomes uh, as a consequence. Uh, in Bolivia, offering preschool nutrients, it turns out that nutritional um, uh, supplements are extremely important in terms of early cognitive development at a very low cost by giving these nutritional supplements at the school you not only raise enrollments but you also raise test scores and increase cognitive potential of the child not just immediately but uh, for the rest of their uh, academic programs and so these sorts of collateral benefits that tie health to the schooling turn out not only to have health benefits, but they also enhance schooling in a very cost-effective manner. In Colombia, we did some work where, um, uh, got it, uh, I, I'll take more than a minute. <laughs> uh, in Colombia, uh, they had private schools that were not fully utilized. And so uh, it turned out that they didn't have enough money to build more secondary schools. So here we were dealing with a situation where you have some schools that, that aren't fully subscribed, other schools that are oversubscribed in the public sector, and not enough uh, uh, space uh, in the public schools, nor an ability to rapidly increase public capacity. And so what they did was they simply had the government get agreements from schools to, uh, at very low cost, uh, accept additional students beyond their regular enrollments. And then they randomized who got access to these vouchers because so many children wanted access to these schools that they uh, uh, over uh, uh, tax the, the actual available vouchers, roughly 90,000 to give you an idea as to how rapidly or how much interest there was in making use of these, of these vouchers. They've since followed the kids who randomly were assigned to these voucher schools versus the others, and what they found was that the kids who got the vouchers were more likely to stay in school longer. They had fewer problems in terms of uh, premarital sex or, or, uh, 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 or single births. They also did better after they left school. So pretty much everything that you would think in terms of the advantages of getting a few more years of schooling turned out to have happened there. So these sorts of voucher programs can be extremely cost effective where you've got excess capacity in, say, the private school system and it's costly to, to rapidly expand. They're not necessarily going to work well in rural areas where you don't have pre-existing private school uh, capacity. In Uganda, they simply went from charging fees of about $3 per year to go to school to free and they had huge increases in, in enrollments. In fact, so huge that they ended up with 70 kids per school. So there's a problem of actually such a huge response from parents that they didn't have the, the uh, ability to rapidly expand the public school capacity enough to make room for everybody else. The last example, and I know I'm over time, is to look at, at, at income transfers that are tied to behaviors that the government may want. So income transfers in Mexico, in Nicaragua, and a lot of other Latin American countries are tied to whether or not the child attends school and whether the, um, the uh, 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 child also attends certain health clinics. So you're tying health, income transfers, and education all together in one package. And it turns out that these also have very uh, promising uh, benefit-cost ratios in, in those countries. So that's by way of a real, and I'll quickly then go over what, what 
uh, the Copenhagen consensus ended up with. They did this process through all these different areas, all these different uh, projects, and they simply ranked them then in terms of which were the most and which were the least cost effective. And so as we go through here, you'll notice which ones uh, ended up in the, in the, in the, uh, in the bottom uh, of, of the group, and then I'll, I'll just briefly relate the top four. The first of these is uh, mis uh, malaria prevention, uh, which turns out to uh, uh, cost about $13 billion, but has very favorable benefit cost ratios, including simply having uh, uh, insecticide set uh, 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 netting. Uh, the next one is uh, looking at um, uh, uh, enhancing free trade, which turns out not to be very costly at all. It simply means uh, you uh, enforce WTO requirements and then apply them. Uh, the next one is uh, some of the malnutrition stuff, not necessarily related to the school system, but uh, also very cost effective and can potentially benefit uh, a third of the population in the world. And then finally, the top one turned out to be uh, methods to try to uh, reduce the spread of, of HIV uh, AIDS. It's interesting that the Gates Foundation and some of these other things are now looking at these particular methods as, as the ones to focus on. Uh, they didn't necessarily uh, participate in the, in the Copenhagen consensus, but you can start seeing different strategies that are being utilized or, or considered in in various uh, private and, and international agencies sort of following along the lines of the Copenhagen Consensus. Thanks. We do need to try to stick to time since there's a, we only have an hour and there's a program starting at 8. Um, so our first respondent will be uh, Professor Tony Smith from Philosophy. Uh, okay, well, that's not very much time at all, uh, so I'll do the best I can. Uh, first of all, uh, I certainly want to say that uh, any the world is certainly going to be a better place if the rich countries can uh, put together $50 billion to help on things like education and uh, health care along the lines that Peter suggested. Uh, most of these, pro I mean, these projects on the whole are incredibly cost effective. You can get a lot of uh, positive return in terms of human uh, well-being for not very much money. Uh, and in a world where Bush is going to ask for three times that amount, uh, simply to come up with some uh, supplemental money to get the Iraq war funded for the rest of the year. Uh, it's certainly an indictment on present priorities that we uh, haven't come up with the $50 billion to do the sort of things Peter talks about way before this. Uh, that, so, so I have no cr criticisms to make of what the report talks about, with the exception of climate change. Um, but we're here to talk about global poverty, and so I want to talk about two points that have to do with what the report doesn't talk about. Uh, and again, we, I have to be sort of quick and oversimplistic here, but I think uh, just to get these things on the discussion, uh, under discussion. Uh, the first is the way the problem is framed. And the problem is framed represents an evolution in mainstream economic thinking uh, from pure neoliberalism. Uh, it wasn't too long ago that most economists thought that all we needed was free trade and free flow of capital across borders and states that protected property rights, and then we could just sit back uh, and watch economic growth and living standards improve. Uh, almost nobody believes that anymore. There are too many countries that follow the neoliberal agenda or had the neoliberal agenda imposed on them uh, that have too much poverty, uh, too much suffering, too much lack of health care uh, for that version of the story to be true, to be accepted anymore. And so now we've gone into something that, I'll, that I call neoliberalism light, which says uh, that what we need, we have to take into account the institutions. Uh, and that the market by itself can't lead to economic growth and improve living standards if the proper institutions are in place. Uh, and this is what this project is about. It's trying to figure out what institutions have to be in place uh, to help lift people out of poverty. Uh, and it turns out that primarily the problem is the institutions in the poor world. Not completely, but primarily the problem is their lack of educational institutions, their lack of healthcare institutions. Now that's an important issue, that's a profound point, and yes, uh, healthcare and uh, education are lacking in these countries, but the way that question is formed systematically stops asking another question. And the other question is whether global poverty might have something to do uh, with the way the global economy works, with the way global capitalism is structured, with the rules of the game. 
and that talk about the inadequacies on, on the local level of uh, poor states and their institutions might not be the whole story. In my view, global capitalism has the peculiar feature of creating immense wealth and poverty simultaneously. There are many aspects of this story, the debt trap, the structural adjustment programs that impose austerity on the poor in order to maximize returns on investors, the refusal to enforce or even acknowledge labor rights, the ability of corporations to play one sector of the global workforce over against another, the transfer of pricing strategies that enable corporations to avoid the domestic taxes that could fund health and education, the capital flight of local elites to, ta to, ta to tax havens with the full complicity of international financial uh, capital, uh, which also prevents local states from getting access to the taxes that could fund education and health programs. The stampedes of speculative capital inflows and outflows that always harm the very groups that benefited least from financial bubbles, and so on and on. If we were serious about addressing global poverty, poverty, we need to be talking about these sorts of things, as well as the need to improve health and education institutions in poor regions. These are the sort of things being discussed in Latin America and elsewhere today. Mass social movements in Venezuela and Bolivia have recently elected regimes committed to break from neoliberal dogma, for example, by ensuring that an increasing share of the nation's oil and gas wealth funds education and health programs for the poor instead of going into the pockets of multinational oil companies. I believe that mass movements of this sort have the potential to be far more successful at alleviating poverty than all of the, than all of the proposals of the Copenhagen Consensus put together. So that was my first remark. My second remark has to do, uh, has to do with science and technology and the role of science and technology uh, in the global economy. We're at a university of science and technology, and so I think we should think about this a little bit. Uh, not that long ago, mainstream economics taught that there was a dominant tendency towards convergence in the global economy. This conclusion was derived from the ideas of perfect competition, declining returns, and the idea that innovations in the scientific technological knowledge underlying them were free public goods available to all. Under these conditions, capital investment should flow to poor regions where the return on invest to capital poor regions where the return on investment would supposedly be higher until all regions of the global economy enjoy the same rate of steady state growth. None of this has much to do with the way global capitalism operates. More recently, mainstream economics have developed something called new growth theory, although the only thing new is the math. The basic idea is found in Marx and Schumpeter. The idea is that capitalist competition is not at all about the pure competition described in economics texts, but rather the ceaseless drive to attain temporary monopolies on product and process innovations and the increasing returns, that is, above average profits, that can be won from them. Leading economists today have to admit that Marx was right after all. The possibility of increasing and extreme divergence is built into the logic of the global capitalist order. Of course, most mainstream theorists cannot quite bring themselves to embrace that idea. Uh, they seem to hold that, uh, in principle, any region of the global economy can prosper as long as it invests in art, research and development, encourages capital inflows, entrepreneurialism, protects intellectual property, provides educated and a healthy workforce, avoids military conflicts, civil wars, and so on. All right, I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, okay, uh, so that, that's, the, that's the view, at least. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind is... 95% uh, 95 of research and development uh, done in the global economy is done in the rich countries. So uh, I'm going to go over to the transparency land here. I'm just a lowly humanist. Never learned enough. Uh, okay, so 95% of research and development is done in uh, the rich countries, and so wealthy regions can get a very nice virtuous circle going here, uh, where if you have access to state-of-the-art research and development, you can make successful innovations. With your successful innovations, you can get monop charge monopoly prices, get higher profit margins, make surplus profits. The surplus profits can fund the next generation of research and development. You can get the next generation of successful innovations. You can make the next generation of higher margins and surplus profits. A nice, virtuous cycle. Uh, of course, if you are in a region of the global economy where 80% of the world's population lives, uh, where firms in the, uh, operating in that region do not have access to state-of-the-art research and development, then you will not make the successful innovations, then you will not get the monopoly prices and the higher profit margins, you will not have the surplus profit, you will not be able to invest in the next generation of research and development, you will not get the next generation of innovations, you will not get the next generation of surplus profits, and so on and so on and so on. 
The structure, the basic structure of the global economy is the dialectical connection of virtuous cycles in a small region of the world and vicious cycles in the, the, the regions of the world where the vast majority of the human species lives. Uh, now this, is, of course, is an oversimplified story and maybe we'll have time to uh, come up with things that make it more complicated. Uh, well, who knows what I'm doing. Uh, but anyway, uh, I would say it's not an accident that the distribution of income in the world looks like this. This is not the sort of structure that putting $50 billion into medicine and education in poor regions of the world is going to reverse. Because the virtuous and vicious circles that I just quickly described are too strong. Are too strong. Now they may improve the they may improve the margin of suffering. They may improve suffering, human suffering at the margin, and that is a profound thing to do. But in terms of fundamentally addressing the real problem in the global economy, which is the which is that the rules of the game are unfair to 80 percent of the human population. Uh, these proposals are not asking that question. It's systematically excluded. Now, this is a static version of things. We could look at it in the terms over time and the relationship between the richest, poorest, uh, 20, the richest 20 percent of the global economy and the poorest 20 percent of the global economy. The way the capitalist global system works is that over time, this difference becomes exacerbated because of the vicious and virtuous circles that I talked about before. Here's another way of looking at it uh, in a more recent framework. The, ra the, the ratio of the richest to the poorest uh, uh, quartile uh, since 1970, and we can see how this slope is going. We can see how this slope is going over time. I don't know if this comes off. Uh, yeah, you can see this fine. Uh, okay, well, this is the way global capitalism works. Should people in that bottom quartile have access to better education? Yes. Should people in that bottom quartile have access to better health care? Yes. Giving $50 billion to help them prove these things is a great thing to do. Is a great thing to do. But the basic point is the global system under the present arrangement is fundamentally unfair. And the great secret is, the great secret is that economists now know this. Not just Marxist economists, mainstream economists now know this. But instead of talking about this, they want to talk about what can we do to make the worst off people have a minimally acceptable life. Now that's fine. I hope everybody has a minimally acceptable life. But let's talk about what, what the point that mainstream economists have finally caught up to Marxists about. And I'll end with a quick quote from, you know, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but uh, I try to read whatever is in English as opposed to mathematics. This is supposedly the best summary of state-of-the-art economic theory by a mainstream economist. The Mystery of Economic Growth by this guy Elfin Helpman. Here's a, here's a passage from it. Investment and innovation widens the gap between rich and poor countries. The output gains of the industrial countries exceed the output gains of the less developed countries. We therefore conclude that investment and innovation in the industrial countries leads to divergence of income between the North and the South. In the globe today, there are about one billion people who just aren't needed by global capitalism. They aren't needed for income, they aren't needed for work, they aren't needed as consumers. And that's the fundamental reality that I think at some point needs to be addressed. Thank you, Professor Smith. <coughs> Our second respondent will be uh, Professor Robert Mazur from Sociology. It's your choice. All right, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about things at a much more local level, the, the sort of the bottom of the pyramid that Tony was just talking about. And what we've had laid out from uh, 
Peter's perspective was really what needs to be done, what these priorities are. And Tony gave us a nice perspective on what this leaves out and the kind of questions and the kind of structural transformation that's left out. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is how we go about doing this. And it's more of a bottom-up perspective, how one does work with the poorest of the poor. And that's the kind of work that I've been involved in throughout my career and the work that we're doing with the center here on campus. And I'll, I'll make four points, and I want to make sure there's enough time for Francis. So I'll make mine maybe a little bit shorter. And I also want you to go away from here thinking about four letters of the alphabet. We start off learning about the ABCs. I just want to add on the letter D to that. And by that, I'm referring to what's known as asset-based community development. And the center that we have here on campus, the Center for Sustainable Rural Livelihoods, uses very much the same kind of an approach. And that is that the way to begin to work with poor individuals and communities is to identify, help them identify their strengths or their assets and their capabilities. We typically tend to think of these, and the things were mapped out very nicely by Peter, we think of these in terms of problems, then how do we put our resources together, our brain power, and roll up our sleeves and do these things together to address these problems. So this is a fundamentally different approach. We start off by understanding what works in a community, in a household, in a community, in a society. And we use that working with the people there to identify what they see as the problems, not what we as outsiders, whether it's from another country or whether it's people from government or someone from the capital city, but what the local people see as problems and what assets and capabilities they have. So what have they been trying to do to solve those problems themselves at the local level and also by having allies throughout the system, uh, throughout the country? What kind of barriers have they faced? How can we together overcome those barriers at the local, at the regional, at the national, and at the international level? So they're grassroots groups that are working all around the world that particularly through the internet now uh, are beginning in contact with each other uh, and so they can share what strategies they are developing and, and learn from others in terms of how they overcome those barriers. Uh, while the, uh, the World Economic Forum has been going on, it's an annual meeting of top economic planners and policymakers <coughs> and those who control the world's capital. The World Social Forum is an alternative kind of meeting that takes place every year at the same time and it started off in Brazil. Uh, and is focused on groups that are not only thinking about that there needs to be an alternative, but that there are alternatives that are already being put into place. And these are where people at local levels are increasingly empowered to begin to. And so some of the examples that Tony mentioned in some countries like in Bolivia where they've stopped the uh, basically sort of the reconquest uh, in the form of multinational corporations and some of the World Trade Organization guidelines as well. So thinking about how do we build local assets and capabilities. Um, and if we can do this, and whether we're talking about people who are living in the countryside or people who are living in the city, I mean the basic rule around the world is you get the health care, you get the education, you get the housing, the quality of life, that you can afford to buy. So if we talk about doing things for people, or government transfers, or somebody coming in and developing local populations, doing things for them, we miss the fundamental point. People need to be in charge of their own development process. So, so that's, it's in that sense that they have some sense of ownership. That's what's gonna contribute to sustainability, some pride in their own self-efficacy, their ability to change their own future. That's the fundamental driving force of development. So how does one go about doing this? Well, increasingly after decades of failure of development projects and quite literally wasted billions and billions of dollars, we're realizing that we have to use increasingly participatory methods. We have to level the playing field. Or in the words of Robert Chambers, we have to, de we have to deprofessionalize we have to leave our professional baggage behind and operate on an equal basis with maybe your peasant who's had two years of education. If we're gonna, if we're gonna be successful, if the efforts that we make are gonna be sustainable, they have to be in the driver's seat. 
So it means we really need to have a significant reversal of roles and put our, our expertise aside. And the first thing we can do is not talk, but listen. So it's a significant challenge to us that are used to coming up with the answers. We look at our own society, we think we're successful, we can just take the show on the road and implement it in other societies. Development doesn't follow blueprints. So the local populations, whether it's in cities or villages, need to be involved. So very participatory methods of planning, of implementation, of monitoring and evaluation, coming up with new strategies for the future, so you repeat that cycle on and on. So how do we go about building assets, whether it's at the individual level, household level, community level? So certainly training and education are an important part of that, but also there needs to be follow-up activities, and there also needs to be material support. But we also need to invest, and so if you remember a couple of weeks ago, the Nobel Peace Prize, Winner was announced. This is the Mohammed Yunus, who is the founder of the Grameen Bank, microfinance or microcredit institution that was established in Bangladesh. He's an economist, by the way. It was established in Bangladesh back in 1974, and that approach is now used in dozens of countries around the world. And so it begins to allow people to have access to a very critical asset, that is capital, working capital, so they can begin to invest. Uh, and this is the, there are certainly certain shortcomings of the microfinance movement. I'd be happy to talk about some of those. Uh, but overall, it's been quite successful and it's allowed people who otherwise are totally marginalized to begin to take control of their lives. And it was for that reason that he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> but the, the asset based community development approach really talks about seven forms of capital. I guess it, we feel like we have to use some terms from economics. So certainly human capital we think of in terms of education and training. Social capital, which is the, the social networks and the context that people have and the way that we support each other. That's particularly important for people who are operating on the economic margins of society. Finance capital I just mentioned. Built capital, so there is a need for roads and infrastructure and water supplies and those sorts of things. Uh, cultural capital, that is that we don't simply try to replace all local cultural practices and institutions, but we recognize that diversity can be a good thing. Uh, I'm going to forget the other two, so <laughs> <laughs> they'll come to me in a few minutes, but I'll end it at that point and pass on to Francis. Um, okay, um, hopefully he can get my, my few slides on, on there for me. Um, what I wanted to do is to um, refocus the discussion a little bit and talk about Africa. I think that the big elephant in the room that we've all refused to mention the name is Africa. Everything that we are talking about here, directly or indirectly, we are referring to Africa. So the question that I'm asking is, uh, can $50 billion make Africa a better place? And uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background of what are the situations in Africa and focus on one or two issues and answer this question at the end of the presentation. Well, what you see here is a, a map, a world map, and uh, is indicated by the GNP per capita. And as you can see, Africa, almost the whole of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, has a GNP per capita by the year 2003, less than $1,000. And here we are talking about all production, the value of all production by nationals in the country. So if you find the average, the production by all nationals in African countries is less than $1,000 per year. Um, we can look at other development indicators. Infant mortality rates. The number of children who die before they reach the first, uh, their first birthday. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest. Um, illiteracy rate, um, Sub-Saharan Africa has um, a little bit higher, except by South Asia. And their life expectancy is 46.5. So if you are from Africa and you are 
50 years, you're leaving an extra five years. Um, another indicator is uh, real GNP per capita. Africa has 56, 564.38. Um, GDP per capita uh, purchasing parity rate is about uh, 1,863. And then if you look at GDP growth per capita, it's 0 0.62. Now, the point I'm trying to show here is that the economic growth in Africa, economic performance in Africa, has been very bad. But I want to draw a point that Africa has not always been that bad. And if you see this data uh, that you see here, as, as recently as 1960, Africa was way ahead of East Asia. Okay? And as the economies of East Asia began to grow up and began to pick up, African's economy began to come down. Now, the question that we don't ask ourselves is, how come that African economy started to decline whilst other economies began to, to increase? I'll probably try to answer that question if that question comes up in a discussion. But I think that is something that economists should be able to think about it and find out what was happening in the 1960s that led to African economies growing and what is happening now. And if you look at this curve, starting from the middle of the 1980s up to about the 1990s, the economies of Africa started going down at the same time that the economies of Asia started going up. Now, let's, uh, I'm from Ghana, so I always want to compare Ghana. Look at the graph for Ghana and Thailand. 1960, Ghana was in many ways similar to Thailand and in many ways similar to um, South Korea. As the economies of those countries started to pick up, the economy of Ghana went down. And by the way, Ghana happens to be, a lot of people see Ghana as one of the shining examples of Africa, a country that is doing very, very well. So if you look at this in the context of a country that is doing very well in Africa, then we have a big problem. Now, I want to focus on two issues, poverty and HIV AIDS. Let's look at um, um, poverty rates. And what you see here is poverty rates for selected regions. The Middle East, Latin America, uh, East Asia, uh, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. About 46% 46 46 uh, of Africans live uh, in poverty. If you look at countries, um, you have Burkina Faso, you have uh, Zambia, you have Central African Republic, you have Nigeria. 70% of Nigerians live on less than a dollar a day. Now, what we see is that although poverty in the, almost the whole of the rest of the world is decreasing, poverty in Africa is almost constant. And in many cases, it has been increasing. By the way, poverty in India and China has uh, decreased very significantly in the last 20 years. And we can ask ourselves whether the decrease in poverty in India and China was a result of aid, like the $50 billion that we are talking about, or was a result of trade. And we can debate those issues. I want us to look at the, uh, one of the issues that is very important, and that is ranked number one by the Copenhagen Consensus, HIV AIDS um, problem. The problem of HIV AIDS is an African problem. And as you can see in this number, the number of HIV AIDS um, increased very significantly um, from 8 million in 1990 to about 38.6 million in 2005. And the largest number of the increase occurred in Africa. Over 63% of people living with HIV are in sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see the curve down there. We can look at the percentage uh, in several Southern African countries, from Swaziland, Botswana, Lesotho, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Namibia. And when we talk about HIV AIDS, we have, it has a lot of social implications. The young, um, skilled um, people who can work in the hospitals, in teaching, in civil service, they are the ones affected with HIV AIDS. That killing the uh, women and leaving a lot of uh, um, um, orphan children that have to be taken care of by society. South Africa, this is the rate, pre percentage of pregnant women infected with HIV AIDS in South Africa. The rate has been increasing very significantly. As of 2003, over 25% of all of women uh, in South Africa um, have HIV AIDS, pregnant women. Now let's summarize the situation in Africa. Africa is the poorest region in the world, with not less than half percent of its total population living less than a dollar a day. Africa accounts for only 1% of global gross domestic product. 
Um, Africa is the most marginal region. 1.7% of wealth trade, 2% of export, and 0.9% of foreign direct investments. One out of five Africans live under armed conflict. Economies are fragmented. They are shallow and they are heavily dependent on the primary sector. So economies depend on petroleum, mining, and agriculture. Very little value added, and that goes back to the research and development issue that was talked about earlier on. Africa is the most indebted and most dependent on, on uh, aid on, in the region in the world. And then Africa has the largest uh, population of HIV AIDS. What I want to do is let's focus on poverty and ask the question, how much will it take to reduce poverty in Africa? And when we are talking about poverty, let's look at one of the objectives that was set up by the UN uh, Millennium Development Goals. That says that we, they plan to, they, they aspire to reduce the population, uh, the poor population in Africa by half by the year 2015. And that is a very simple definition. To increase half of Africans' population to live under, uh, at least above a dollar a day. To increase that above the dollar limit. And that's how much is going to cost us to do that. Now, achieving this goal in order to make sure that half of the population in Africa live on more than a dollar a day, it will mean that African economies must grow at 7% per annum. Sustained rate for 7% per annum. Now, um, the current African population, I mean, uh, economic growth is 2.1%. And then we have the population growth rate of 2.8%. Um, so if your population is growing at 2.8% and your economy is growing at 2.1%, you find out the difference. What is the growth rate? It's 0. 0.0 something. That's the growth rate of the African economy. In order to achieve this objective, the UN objective by 2015, it is estimated that Africa will need 54 billion per year in additional resources. That is $54 billion a year from external resources just to reduce poverty, just to ensure that half of Africans' population live on a dollar or more a day. Now, let's ask the question, can $50 billion make a difference in Africa? It cannot address the problem of poverty. I think there are more fundamental structural problems that need to be addressed. And, and I think um, um, previous speakers have talked about that. I'll be happy to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Osa, and uh, thanks to all of the re respondents and the speaker on our panel. Uh, yes, Pat? The lecture at at five after the hour, so we have about seven minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, let's uh, see if there are questions from the floor, and perhaps that will allow persons on our panel to respond to one another as well. Does somebody have a concise question that they would like to pose? Yes? Um, my question. Uh, we do have a microphone, if you don't mind, and perhaps other pe if there are other people. Well, my professor, uh, my question is for Professor Smith. Okay. And um, you said that it isn't fair for the econ or the economy isn't very fair, and you were talking about the um, virtuous and vicious cycles of development. How would you propose to fix that? Uh, well, that's not gonna, anything I can answer quickly. Uh, <laughs> um, in my ideal world, uh, there would be we, we have there have been a lot of people who have been thinking about uh, something that's called market socialism, uh, where we take advantage of the uh, of the efficiencies of markets and the things that markets can do well, uh, while while rejecting the parts of markets that are structurally unfair. Uh, in the world today, the top one percent of population in the country, and these people who basically own capital. Uh, appropriate between 66 and 71 percent of the global income. Now markets are great things, but capitalist markets lead to that sort of concentration of wealth. 
uh, that I'm against. So in, if you want my short version of an ideal world, uh, it would have consumer markets so consumers can make choice. It would have pr producer markets so, pr so companies could decide for themselves what inputs to buy and not have some bureaucrat tell them. Uh, but it would not have labor markets. It would be based on a worker co-op model. Uh, it would not have capital markets. Nobody should be able to privately own society's productive resources, in my view. Uh, and it would have a principle that every region of the world had access to its per capita share of new investment funds. So if Africa has X percent of the population of the world, community banks in Africa should have X percent of the new investment funds in the world to allocate to African companies. Another question? Does, um, I, uh, does any kind does, uh, British, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French colonization have anything to do with did you guys hear me? Sorry. Does British, Portuguese, Spanish, you know, French colonization have anything to do with like the position of Africa? That was it positive or negative on Africa's economic situation? Because when you look at the graph, a lot of things happened during 1960, like countries that colonized Africa leaving Africa and then leaving Africa to itself after they've pretty much destroyed it and taken all the money out of it. Yes, I, I, I think that uh, the Africa's colonial history has a very significant impact on, on the development problems that we face in Africa now. Um, the colonialists did not just take away resources, but they also changed institutions. And uh, that made it uh, very, very difficult for, for African leaders coming out of um, independence to be able to pursue development. Um, on a more general terms, what happened after independence was that um, that was a period where many African countries, governments were the ones that were leading investment. And the economic systems in Africa during that time were not based on the free market liberal economic policies that we have now. So governments were able to uh, ensure investment, uh, protect workers and that kind of thing. All those changed as a result of the economic crisis of the 1970s and the 1980s, and that led to the imposition of free market economic policies. And as we've seen, after implementing free market economic policies for the last 20, 30 years, Africa has nothing to show. Investment is not there. Africa is not participating in the global trade. So Africa is not benefiting from the world economic system as it operates now. Thank you. How how does uh, corruption and um, the volatile like conflicts going on in Africa all the time and other parts of the world play in? Because I don't think you can just take fifty billion dollars if the people are corrupt yeah. and there's fighting yeah. like a lot of times. I I I I agree with you that corruption is important and I look. I know there's corruption in Africa. There's corruption everywhere. There is corruption here. There is corruption there. I, I, I don't want to accept the fact that um, um, Africans are so corrupt that they cannot manage their affairs. Corruption, there's corruption in Africa, there's corruption in Asia, there's corruption in North America, there's corruption in, the, in the Europe. There's corruption everywhere. Human beings by nature are corrupt. If you give them the freedom, they'll be corrupt. There are institutions in place that prevent corruption. And what you see in Africa is that we have a lot of corruption going on because there are poor, and if you take even $100,000, I mean $100,000, that becomes a big issue. Um, let me give you an example. Um, the former president of Ghana, who was a president for about 20, 15 years, one of the major complaints that people had against his wife was that the wife had a jacuzzi. And I don't think that buying a jacuzzi um, can amount to taking all the resources from your country. So if the first lady of the country has a jacuzzi, I don't see that as a major corruption, but it made headlines everywhere. That's one part of the problem, that there's corruption in Africa, but the corruption in Africa is sometimes over-exaggerated. I'm not making excuses for African leaders, but that's a fact. The second point about armed conflict, there's armed conflict in Africa, but the armed conflict have their roots going back to the colonial days. Uh, what happened in Rwanda, um, the Tutsis and the Hutus just did not get up and start killing themselves. The whole thing was set up by the colonial administration. So we need to address some of those issues. Do we have time for one more? Well, I think that you, you don't want to poo-poo these, these problems and blame everything on uh, uh, the 
past. I mean, I, I think that you, you have many examples of countries that uh, had everything, uh, I mean, look at Zimbabwe, everything was looking good, they were self-sufficient in food, they were growing well. Uh, Mugabe gets nervous about retaining power, uh, drives out, uh, eliminates, uh, and I'll, I'm an economist. I'm pretty confident property rights and the ability to take your human capital and move it into areas where it has a return and not be afraid of, of having someone take it away from you, that that's very important for growth. Zimbabwe is a basket case purely because of the failure of the government to, to take advantage of the resources that they had and to allow people to, to act in their own way. Turn it around and you look at Uganda, which was a basket case about uh, uh, 30 years ago um, under uh, uh, Idi Amin. Uh, it's now looking relatively uh, promising and a lot of that is simply making sure that people have the uh, ability to act on their own resources, take their human capital and apply it and not have some and not feel that they are at risk of succeeding and therefore having it taken away. Um, I mean here in, in Iowa, I mean we have a, a very strong faith in, in the role of human capital and, and the ability of human capital to, uh, uh, to find its own own rewards. Um, certainly, T.W. Schultz got the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, former chair of the Department of Economics here, uh, for, for his work on human capital and development. Um, so I think that if, in fact, human capital is allowed to move to its, own, its most profitable area in Africa, you would have a lot more, uh, more success. I don't think you can poo-poo uh, the, the issue of, of how crippling AIDS is, on the other hand. And, and uh, when you see infection rates of, of over a third of the population, I mean, uh, it's, it's really hard to come up with ways of, of solving those particular problems. Can I, can I respond to you quickly? Quickly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the, the issue of Zimbabwe, we just, anytime something happens in Africa, we just take it out of proportion. Now, when, um, after the war, we went to South Korea, the Japanese have taken the land in South Korea. What did we do? The U.S. oversaw land redistribution in South Korea, and that was what actually laid the foundation for economic development. Now, why is it a problem when you are redistributing land in Zimbabwe? Well, they redistributed it to the other members of the government. They didn't. Uh, those farms are basket cases now. There's no food being produced in Zimbabwe. The, prop, the, the reason why that is happening, I mean, uh, we can debate about how it was done. Corruptly. We can debate about how it was done. There is no question about the need for land distribution. The land, over 90% of the land was occupied by just about 2% of the population. There was a need for land reforms. We can debate about how it was done. That's a different question. I think that will need to be the last word. Uh, perhaps the panel members would be willing to continue talking with uh, folks in the audience uh, if they are, are able to stay. But I want to thank those of you who came out tonight to attend this program and those of you who were on the panel. Thank you very much. And perhaps our panelists would commit in advance to returning next semester and continuing the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Another hour. <laughs>